let me invite you to welcome Professor Mihai Nadine. You are very kind. Thank you. And everybody who is here is very kind. If you read the slide, you are going to find out at least what I would like to cover today. Professor Khalili Kool mentioned some of my books, and I'm using the chance to uh, show you a book, The Civilization of Illiteracy. When I wrote it, I thought it's the last book of the civilization in which books are still written. In the meanwhile, we are experiencing tons of books, some of them which qualify as garbage at best before even they are published, some of them which are really very interesting, some of them which are scary. This morning I read again, you know, I subscribe to a service of Google that gives me news in various domains, and one domain is semiotics. And I read about a book that was issued actually a little uh, earlier, but Google is catching up, Buddhist semiotics. And I said, oh boy, I almost said it in Yiddish, oi mir, Buddhist semiotics, so the next is going to be what? You cannot do that. And therefore you heard the message that Professor Kalevi Kuhl mentioned to you, if we don't pay attention to the fundamentals of the discipline, the discipline will dilute to the extent that we are going to have Buddhist semiotics, but we are not going to have any semiotics, which is a very dangerous situation. And I say that because within the conference, there was more than once a discussion on signs and language. It disturbs me, it hurts me. Uh, don't we know what tautological expressions are? Don't we know that language is a system of signs? One of the very many. And there are many languages. When somebody builds a whole system in which in the hierarchy you have signs and later on you have someplace language, I say, what is happening to us, those who are involved in semiotics? I heard even in this conference, and it hurt me, but it hurts me now for 20 years, people talking about signs and symbols. Whew. What else, how, how much more trivializing can we be when we do not understand that? If you talk about the construct called sign, you need to have a discipline. You need to have a coherence. Therefore, in our discussion today, I'm going to go two, three steps back to some science theories and try to explain a little why I'm so obsessed with coherence. But this image that has to do with the book, in the meanwhile, I, I'm not advertising for the book. The book is uh, available in its entirety on the web. You can download it from my website, from any websites. I'm happy that, you know, there are many people who would like to read it. I brought these books here to Tartu, and here I'm going to uh, stop a little uh, to uh, explain to you why in the world am I in Tartu. Some people are asking me, what are you doing here? Why are you here? Recently, a person who is suspected of might become a candidate to the presidency in the United States, one of those jobs that you prefer not even to think about, uh, remembers that he went with his rabbi to the wall in Jerusalem, and the rabbi stopped 10 meters away from the wall and said, you can go. And the guy said, rabbi, aren't you coming? No, why aren't you coming? I'm not worthy. Now let's move it from religion to Tartu. I'm not sure that I would have come to Tartu that I associate with Lotman and with the activity of distinguished colleagues. Uh, Professor Kuhl uh, honored me today introducing me. Uh, deepest gratitude, deepest gratitude to all the colleagues who organized this conference. Uh, you, my colleagues, put in an extreme effort in making such a conference possible. And in a world that is not really terribly inclined in supporting semiotics, this is almost a heroic act. At the same time, I'm very happy that I see here present 
people who are at least six months younger than am I than I am means there is a future to it. Because if everybody would be at my age, I would say, okay, let's close this uh, door and let's go. You know, it's only going to fall apart. So this is the, the optimistic part. The book deals with the integrated human being in a phase of the development of our civilization that for all practical purposes we can only understand as a semiotic phase. As opposed to the time when people still used to take a hammer and hit something in order to make something with it, yeah? We are at this moment in mediated activities. Almost the entire human activities of a mediated nature. Wars are carried out in a mediated form. Drones are flown from Florida to kill somebody at uh, 6,000 miles away. You don't even know that you killed. And the other person does not have the time to understand that in this virtual world, you are no more than a coordinate. In other words, the real person was translated into something of a virtual nature. That image kind of tells you where I'm coming from, but it does not yet tell the whole story, and I'm going to run through two, three slides, not before giving you this wonderful quote from Peirce. He was not a contemporary of the drone world, and if you still read that sentence, you say, boy, this is thinking. This is a bit of thinking, because we are in this moment in which the so-called deficiency Okay, of the virtual, starts being a very important point. But we are in a world in which, guess what? 97% of all American teens are involved in semiotic activities. They are not playing in the backyard. They are not playing with the things that I grew up with. You know, climbing on something, falling, breaking, things like that. It's 97%, and the adults are 53%, and you're going to say, boy, those Americans. And you are right. You know, uh, uh, if you know Russian, Nepugnik might tell you something, and if you read Ilya Petrov, you know what the uh, Nepugnik idiot of uh, Ilya Petrov made allusion to. But we're not even playing those games. Would be interesting if people would play games. Then you say, I play with you, either you or I win. No, we do something even more interesting. And at the same time, let's think about it. We're watching others play. And if you look at what does it mean to watch others play, 150 million people play over 20 hours a week, which means they are burning some of their neurons in watching people play video games. That's a very interesting development. Let's not forget it. We are not, and I looked around, I haven't seen among the students anyone from South Korea. But look at this image. It's coming. It's coming to the extent that if you don't realize what's happening in, in this universe, then you are in the other universe. Now, how many Americans are here present at this time? Okay, you know what NSA is. Everybody else in this room knows. If you don't know, don't worry. They know, who, they know you. Just to give you the translation. Now, along this line of the translation, I called it with a little question mark, National Semiotic Agency. They do semiotics. They do semiotics to an extent that we can almost be envious. How do, they, how do they know so much about it? Did they ever come to Tartu to study semiotics? I doubt it. Did they read Lotman's book? Yeah, maybe they have one analyst paid to read books and say this is of interest to us or not, but not more than that. But if you look at those various programs that the NSA has, including the program on listening to the conversation of Angela Merkel, of president, the president of France, of you name it. And I said, even me, even you, I say me, the most insignificant, you are more important, they are listening to you. Okay. Having said that, why do I say that it is a semiotic activity? 
I say that it's a semiotic activity because they translate various segments of conversations into machine readable and interpretable information. Not many semioticians from among those that I am familiar with can claim to have this competence. And guess what? You are claiming that you understand Dostoevsky. I have my doubts. What does it mean I have my doubts? It means that we are not yet good enough in understanding the meaning of the various semiotic activities in which we are involved. It's a, it's a very strange uh, lesson. I want to bring to your attention this particular lower side of the slide in which I say, to the left you have the human interaction with computers. I was part of those who tried to do interfaces. Uh, at that moment I was a happy guy and I was very proud if you would have seen me walk around, you would have seen me you know, straight and expecting somebody to shake my hand and say, look what he did. Today I have my doubts, but you look at the second part on the right side. It's totally irrelevant. It's totally irrelevant, the human being. We are at the, this moment at the interaction among machines. Machine A interacts with machine B, interacts with machine C, and there is no more work left. The level at which we need the human being is getting lower and lower. We need the human being to clean toilets in the United States, and those are the Mexicans. I don't know who cleans the toilet in Estonia. I hope that, you know, Estonians still share in their amount of work, but the Major dynamic is a dynamic in which we are making machines smarter and people more and more stupid. It's a very interesting dynamic to which we contribute, all of us. We contribute to, to this phenomenon of getting the machine smarter. How, how about the question, how many of you know what deep learning means? Okay. But you all know what neuronal nets are. Am I right? You know what neurons are. Am I right? Okay. In computer science, in artificial intelligence today, the most recent development is called deep learning. There are programs developed that play computer games better than human beings. And you say, wonderful. At least you don't damage human beings. What does this deep learning mean? You went from learning, in which you gave the machine the ability to understand words. You go now to the next level, in which you teach the machine to associate various words. And once you did that, you are overcoming the major problem of the relation between us and machines. Machines don't know ambiguity. A machine, in order to do something, expects from you that you give it a clear instruction. Move to the left. Do something to the right. Ambiguity is not where machines can operate. What do we do now? We are building, and this goes back to an observation, thank you again, uh, made by the president of the association, and I'm glad that I'm part of the association. You told me that I'm a member, even after... In I answered you yesterday a little, uh, uh, Kurt. So, we are at, the, at this moment looking at the development in which there is a theoretic field called ontology in which we would also like to ground semiotics and there is a field of application called ontology where people who are trying to translate everything of a semiotic nature into machine language are making a living. And they are making a way better living than semioticians. Uh, recently, you can see on your own, the logicians started asking the question, is there a future to logic? When the logicians are asking this question, keep in mind, a computer is nothing else but Boolean logic 
and an alphabet made out of two letters, zero and one. Yeah? And the logicians are asking, is there a future to logic? We need to ask the question, is there a future to semiotics? But the question has to be asked from a different perspective. And I'm claiming today that one of the ways to deal with semiotics is to try to understand what makes it necessary. And my main subject today is to convince you that semiotics is made necessary by the fact that we are dealing with change. If the world would not change, we would not exist. None of us would be here. Since the world exists, at one moment in this existence, we have this little clean distinction between that which is living and which is, that which is not alive. Change in the non-living world, go to the ocean, you are going to see the wind, you are going to see the waves, you are going to see everything. You see a huge stone, and if you come back 5,000 years later, you are going to see sound, sand there. It's change, yeah? Change in my interaction with this gentleman who has a camera on me is of a different nature. He says, am I going to run after his face all the time? What's happening here? Okay. That change has also to do with the change in our understanding of who we are. And most important, semiotics is the domain that returns to us the highest value in my mind that is available today, which is the awareness of change. You can be passive in a changing world. You can be active in a changing world. You can initiate change. In this respect... I have to divulge a little to my background. Yes, Charles Sanders Peirce is the originator of some of my thoughts. I had the honor and the, and the privilege of having a colleague whom some of you might remember, know, Solomon Marcus, a distinguished Romanian mathematician, but not only, who had more freedom than I had at that time. He was able to bring from the West, some of the purse volumes, and he made Xerox copies for me. And I had it home, and my wife didn't like it. Tons of Xerox copies of purse volumes. It's a nice way to read purse when you don't have purse, you know, whenever you want it, you go to the library, or you go online, yeah? But it forces you to read it. And I came to the con come to the conclusion and I'm not saying it was any degree of pleasure that many people read, uh, 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 speak about purse. Very few read purse. And that refers not only to purse, it refers to others. I want also to claim some relation to the amazing thinking of Leibniz. You are going to see that I'm going to mention Leibniz as well. Yes, Lotman is one of those who drew my attention a lot. During the time when I was associated with the Semiotic Center at Brown University, we went a lot into the Russian type of semiotics. Didn't excite me at that time. However, the big revelation was Robert Rosen. And I'm presenting you here with his model. He is a scientist who thinks in models. He sees the natural world, which all, we all belong, and which has causation in it. And then he sees our representation of this world, in which we do all kinds of things. We write texts, we write equations, we produce images, and then we manipulate them. Einstein did not go outside on the street with one of the telephones to measure the speed of light. He was manipulating descriptions, and from those manipulations of descriptions, he inferred to the entailment. That was the relation. That is, that is a fascinating moment. Oops, I went the wrong way. And here is, if you don't mind, probably the only slide that I would claim if you did not listen to my lecture at all, but you would like the short of it, that's the short of it. We are living in a changing world, and at the moment when I ch take in this changing world, it changes me at the same time. 
once it changes me at the same time, my own change in this changing world is changing the world again. So we are involved in an infinite loop, okay, in which the ability to describe the change without actually reporting on our own change does not exist. Semiotics is a construct supposed to help us describe the situation of be part of change and describe it as though it would not affect you. That's why you would not hear from me words such as objective and subjective. In the Soviet Union and in Romania under communism, subjective and objective were the official words. If something was wrong, then it was subjective, and it was very wrong, then it was idealistic and subjective. You know, if you had this experience, fine. If you didn't, be happy. Okay? The changing observer is part of the changing world applies to any form of science, semiotics or not. You know, it seems that those in physics, they look at the tree, and here you have the uh, apple falling, and here you have the equation, and poof, life is so easy. It would not be so easy if you would read everything behind it, such as, by, for, for instance, the fact that Newton was trying to involve God in explaining gravity. It was a very uh, 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 difficult attempt. But you cannot ignore the fact that in his many thoughts, he was trying to answer the question, why is the apple actually falling down and not falling up? And if it would fall up, what would be the consequences? That's why equations written in physics accept time running in both directions. If you look at the equations, and if you know a little mathematics, and I hope you do, otherwise, okay, uh, you'll find out why that's not good. Uh, that is a very important thought to have. The distinction that I... Okay, I'm still in time. The distinction that I want to bring to your attention is a distinction that cost over time many people Sometimes even their academic career, other times at least they didn't get a, a Nobel Prize. Elsasser, Walter Elsasser, a distinguished physicist who worked with people such as Schrödinger, Niels Bohr, all of them who took the Nobel Prize, by the way. And he was very close to doing the same. But he dared to do a foundation of natural sciences. He dared to come out and say, I'm going from the perspective of physics, where he was one of the best of that time, to give you a foundation for what we would call biology. And in that foundation, he talks about things such as creativity. Stones are not creative. I didn't tell you something that you did not know. What does it mean to be creative? He sticks to the simplest definition of creation. To do something that did not exist before. To facilitate something that did not exist before. A mother gives birth, that's an act of creation. And he takes also note of the fact, which I'm going to bring to your attention, because it's essential to what we're talking today, that as opposed to the physical world, creativity in the living is such that you do not have identity. And this brought me back to something that I read when I was very young, Aristotle. I punished myself, I read Aristotle. I say I punished myself because I didn't understand too much. And here's the sentence, no two blades of grass are the same. I read it five times and I said, so what's the big deal? And today I understand that's a fundamental observation. If you look at everyone in this room, behind our reality as we see each other, there is a stem cell. How does the stem cell know how to 
evolve into something that makes us so different. He's so much more wonderful than I am. He's so much more smarter. He's so much more blonde. I pointed to him blonde because I have less hair than him. Things like that. This infinite creativity which is intrinsic in the living makes for the possibility and necessity of something that we use in order to make distinctions. And that's the, the necessity of semiotics. Without the semiotics, those distinctions could not be made. After I claim that I showed you the most important slide of my presentation, I will claim this is a slide that requires your attention because it deals with why didn't Elsa Sasser get a Nobel Prize. Because those guys who claim that the living is not the same with the physical were called vitalists. They were push them away, those guys are very close to religion, they are very close to who knows what. Descartes told us that everything is a machine, Descartes told us that we can do reductionism, Descartes told us that everything is cause and effect. Who are you to come and tell us things are not so easy? Who are you to tell us that actually you cannot reduce the human being. You cannot reduce any being. You cannot reduce the mono cell to the physical. The, mono, the, the, the living is manifested through some quality that I'm going to talk in a short time about called anticipation that the physical does not have. Now, the great mathematician Gödel, Kurt Gödel, I'm not going to ask here whether you heard about Gödel. I want to assume that everybody did. If you didn't, I would feel very bad. I'll say, okay. So could Gödel, in trying to solve one of the very interesting problems that came from Hilbert, the great mathematician, is looking at the possibility of defining whether our representation of the world is such that we can call it complete and consistent. Now, even assuming that you know girl by heart, and I start there. Everybody in this room knows girl by heart, so if I, do, if I say something wrong, you can start throwing stones at me. So, assuming that you know girl by heart, you know that he defines the decidable as describing a system that I can entirely describe and that description is consistent, not contradictory. Okay? I'm willing to take an epistemological bet with you that if you look at physical entities and I go back to the stone and I go back to whatever you want, they are decidable. The living is not decidable. The living, even at the level of the monocell, is undecidable. You cannot give it a full description that is at the same time consistent. I introduced the notion of G complexity, G from Gödel, not from God or who knows what. Yeah? I introduced the notion of G complexity as being characteristic of the living. The awareness that the living is undecidable is telling us that our use of the word complexity usually is wrong. We talk about the complexity of the networks, etc. No, they are not complex. They are complicated. There is a distinction between complex and complicated. Complexity means the ability to interact. The networks don't interact. The networks are pre-programmed to work in a certain manner. Undecidable science is the result of undecidable cognitive processes. And the majority of our cognitive processes are undecidable. I almost don't need to 
give any commentary on this slide. What I'm arguing for is an understanding of semiotics as a description of various knowledge domains. And in this case, I'm going back to semiotics as being the unity between the way in which we express ourselves, we communicate, and for me to communicate means nothing else but to bring together. That's the meaning of the world, to communicate. And the significance, the knowledge that we acquire. We acquire all the time, we share all the time, and in this process of sharing knowledge, we sometimes even produce more. As you see, there are many specialized semiotics that correspond to the various sciences. The earth science, the social science, they all have their own particular semiotics. There's here somebody who I talked to coming from Brazil who is teaching chemistry. He is dealing with the particular semiotics that is embodied in the chemical symbolism. You don't need to get involved in that. Let the chemist deal with it and make it as efficient as it can be. It's a particular language that you need in order to acquire knowledge from a particular domain. I'm mentioning here, showing you only covers of books that goes, go back to uh, Copernicus. You all heard about Copernicus. Uh, Galileo Galilei, etc. If you look at those images, you understand that each of the authors is defining a semiotics that corresponds to what particular subject that book has. Semiotics is offering us the possibility to deal with the generality of a means for capturing distinctions in the world. And those distinctions, as you see, end up to be signs. That's how semiotics was defined so far. Behind the word semiotics, I don't want to go into the whole history. Either you stick to semion, or you go to the uh, Hebrew ot, or you can go to many other uh, variations. What is most important, and what gives life to semiotic, is the answer to the question. What is it going to bring me in terms of knowledge if I interpret something as a sign? As opposed to people who say everything is a sign, I say no. Nothing is a sign unless interpreted as a sign. If everything would be a sign, then nothing is really a sign. You cannot make the distinction. In any definition that's a logical minimum, you need a reference and you need a distinction. Otherwise, there is no definition. During my... Brown Association, I gave a lecture on semiology, this was sur, and I was way younger than I am now, and I went by the title, Semiology, Is It Nonsense? Today I feel ashamed that I did that, because Saussure was not present to tell me, hey, oh, you, did you understand what I was doing before you questioned me? And probably I didn't understand enough. Today I would like to make you aware of the fact that even semiotic perspectives that I do not necessarily consider always appropriate have their own internal coherence. If you have a coherent perspective, you can talk about a system that will give you, will afford you some knowledge. And I want to bring to your attention the fact that so sur made it clear that he looks at his system, signifiant, signifié, as having a social role. That's a dimension that we often forget, ignore, do not pay enough attention to. But sure, I am in the domain in which I feel almost at home, and that's never good. If you start feeling too comfortable, means that you start losing some distinctions. And I bring Peirce up for a very simple reason. I hope that I will never be again at the semiotic conference where people saying that I'm working in Persian semiotics talk about symbols or talk about uh, icons. There is no such thing in Peirce. 
If you want to talk about the sign within Charles Per semiotics, you have to define the relation between what is represented, how is it represented, what's the process of interpretation. But all three dimensions need to be there. You cannot go with one dimension. When, when, again, I, I was hearing, uh, we need a symbolic component to it. Oh, it's iconic and it's symbolic. Really? You'd never read Peirce. You only read people who wrote something about Peirce, who wrote something. So, not even second hand, third hand. It's now fifth hand, uh, end hand literature. If you decide to go with Persian semiotics, you owe it to the coherence of the system to refer to all the three domains that make the sign in their unity. Otherwise, you're not doing Persian semiotics. You're doing your own, which is fine. In a free society, to each his own. Uh, so, what do I want to catch from the object? Do I want to catch the object as a quality? Do I want to catch the object in its singularity or in its degree of necessity? Yes, you can talk about symbolic representation, but you cannot talk about symbol. You can talk about iconic representation, but you cannot talk about icons. There are no such things as indexical signs. They are indexed to something else. What do they index? You need to know that. And then there are the levels of semiotics. We are what we do. Not to understand semiotics as being in the first place pragmatically driven is to condemn semiotics to insignificance. We are what we do. I am giving you a lecture at this moment. You are a listener. He is a skeptical person saying, what does this guy want from me? That's his identity at this... I just made this up, so I'm not a mind reader. Okay? okay? We are what we do is we are constituting ourselves continuously in the activities in which we are involved. The same thing applies to the ants. When I hear that in Germany they are going to have a ma march of half a million ants to demonstrate against the ecological policy of this and that, I say, that's what the ants want to do. I'm not so sure, but okay, we are what we do. Understanding this means do not look at meaning at the semantic level. There's meaning only in what we do and in the purpose. Therefore, and here's the jump, an anticipatory system is a system whose current state depends not only upon previous states, but also upon possible future states. If I have in my hand a stone and I drop it, it will fall, and we know how to describe the process through the laws of physics. And if I drop it five billion times from the same position, assuming that I am there for five billion times, you understand what time it takes, it will fall the same way. If I drop a cat, it will never fall the same way twice. That's the difference between a reactive system and an anticipatory system. Anticipation is not guessing. Anticipation is not prediction. Anticipation is not prolepsis. It is not forecast. Anticipation is always expressed in action. The falling of the cat is the action that will allow the cat to fall in a way that will not affect it. A little better example. In a different lecture, being myself amazed by what pregnancy means, I'm not a woman, as you probably can guess, but my wife is the mother of our three children, so I know something about that. The whole process of pregnancy is a process in which anticipation is expressed. 
A woman would be much better than me in describing what happens. I can only tell you that the geometry of the body changes. Because otherwise, you have here a big piece of weight, you would fall on your nose. You don't. You don't because the body was changed before the weight started changing the statics. Not only that, the whole activity of the body, the whole physiology is changing. The body starts producing substances that will diminish the pain caused by the baby, by the suckling on the nipple. Those are all anticipatory expressions of a tremendous nature. So anticipatory systems are systems that are driven not only by a previous state, but also by future states. To understand the relation between uh, semiotics and anticipation uh, means first to understand what semiotics is and then to understand what anticipation is. In regard to semiotics, I will remind you that there are three ways in which we can represent things, the iconic, the indexical, and the symbolic representation. I will remind you also that semiotics, despite the fact of having a very long history, is even today considered a quite exotic discipline. And in this respect, I'm bringing up the old story of the Monsieur Jourdain syndrome in which the characters in Monsieur Jourdain are amazed that they are speaking prose. And I would say the same thing holds true for many people in linguistics or in computer science who will be surprised that, to find out that they are speaking semiotics without knowing, first of all, what it is. Second, when one tries to explain to them what semiotics is, they will react, ah, oh, it's only this. Only this meaning, they never ask the question, how do we represent things? And second, how can we improve upon representations, which are essentials, essential in any act of knowledge uh, acquisition? Finally, I want to bring to the attention of those who would like to understand what semiotics is, what the grounding of semiotics would mean. And grounding means where, is, where resides the necessity of our concerns for understanding what semiotics is. And I would claim, and this is what the slide explains, that Semiotics is an instrument that helps us become aware of change. You have a deterministic world in which the past is affecting the present. And in, you have then the future affecting the present as a space of possibilities. That space of possibilities is made out of our perception of consequences of our actions. I claim that the foundation for semiotics is within an understanding of anticipation. At the level of the cell, as much as at the level of our interaction, macro level, societal level, we are not weighing each other He's not looking at me and saying, what's going through his mind? When is he going to finish? That would be measurement. We are doing interpretations that are of a semiotic nature. Pensare means, has a lot to do with weighing, measuring, putting numbers. In this day and age of big data, in which, in which everyone who wants money from the government should put in an application and you will get it. And if not from the money, the great corporations have something to sell you if you say the word big data. And if you have problems with that, I will teach you how to spell it. In this day and age, I will claim, as opposed to the physical environment that requires that we describe it using big data in the living the data is small. 
the monocell survives on one bit of information. In the, at the biosemiotic level, if you want, the amount of information changed is absolutely minimal. There is a huge number. That's why we talk about 83 billion neurons. There's a huge number of them. But each is doing something very little. And does what it does even very slowly. Where is the semiotician who today would run a great program in identifying the type of information that the, uh, allow us to do those distinctions that are of a semiotic significance? At this moment, after having gained some understanding of what semiotics is and what anticipation is, we will have to dig a little deeper and look at the subject, which in the end is building a semiotic system, a semiotic understanding of the world, and at the subject as embodying anticipation processes. What needs to be said is that life is not reducible to a machine. You probably heard the sentence many times. Uh, my slide that I present to you is only giving you a chance to read more thoughts uh, on the same subject. What I would like to uh, make clear here is that as opposed to a machine, the human being evolves in a way that does not involve any form of repetition. The machine's future state is predefined in the design of the machine, in the purpose of the machine. There is no place for ambiguity in any machine. In the human domain, Ambiguity plays an enormous role. Our own existence is the expression of ambiguity. It is also time here to advance the understanding that as opposed to a machine whose functioning we can understand by looking at the components of the machine, the human being cannot be explained by taking parts of the human body and trying to infer from those parts to the whole of our existence in the world, to the whole of our interaction with other human beings or with other livings. The nomothetic, which was defined by Windelband uh, around 1915s, defines an area that we can describe using laws. The ideographic advances an understanding of the world made of specific events. Machines pretty much embody the nomothetic. The living, no matter how complex or less complex, Actually, it's always complex. The living is always ideographic. The living is the domain of infinite diversity. Here is where the genius of Bernstein, Bernstein for the Russians, uh, comes to expression in the formula repetition without repetition. The living can be understood only from a holistic perspective. In addition to this, Elsasser, who came from physics, was pretty determined in stating that the living is an expression of creativity. Nothing in the living is the same. Data in the form of a description of events as they take place along the timeline is usually called history, such as the king died on March 23rd, 1766, the queen died three days later. This is a narration. It is the recounting of events along, as I mentioned already, the timeline. 
the king died and then the queen died of grief. That's a story. But the same thing can be said in respect to the data that we acquire when we look at physical phenomena or when we look at phenomena characteristic of the living. Interest in finding a language that can describe time series, that can, can describe narrations, or can describe stories is going back in history to the first uh, attempts at capturing in some form our realization that things change over time. Leibniz deserves to be recalled in this respect because he is very focused on discovering a universal language, a lingua adamica, as he calls it, capable not only of describing things that we're aware of, such as a musical score or uh, a work of art or a piece of uh, philosophic writing in Chinese, but would like that language to have also a generative dimension that can, so that we can use it in order to produce new narrations or in order to generate new histories. For semiotics to be really helpful in the day and age of more and more data that expects to be processed and interpreted, semiotics itself has to be precise. In the sense, I'm going to bring uh, to your attention the distinction between data and information. Too many people confuse the two. Too many, even scientists, scholars, researchers, do not understand that data is a quantitative description of phenomena. And for many reasons, data comes most of the time in the form of numbers presented in some, uh, in some form. Information is data associated with meaning. In the sense, I have to bring to your attention the fact that Shannon, considered the father of the information theory, actually said it very clearly. My theory is not an information theory. I do not have an information level. My theory is one of the data of the syntactic level of whatever we transmit through our channels of communication. The knowledge domain of semiotics is meaning. I'm simply illustrating you here several levels of meaning in respect to a famous painting that comes to us from the Renaissance, the birth of Venus, and you can on your own find out that these levels of meaning go uh, as far as the quotes from the Greek mythology, from the Roman mythology, uh, they go as far as to Piero de' Medici, to the Neoplatonic views, to Christianity, and there is a lot that you see in this painting that makes reference to meaning from an aesthetic perspective. In our days, obviously, we are going to deal with uh, the semiotics, which means the representation of various processes through what are called complex networks. In other words, trying to associate various objects of interest through networks. Finally, from the perspective that I try to introduce to you, it has to be clear to you that knowledge is a construct. Knowledge is not something that we examine a phenomenon and something jumps to us and says, this is how you can interpret me. We can look at the same thing from various perspectives and we are going to build various bodies of knowledge that correspond to these various perspectives. Data, information, and meaning are one constitutive element of knowledge. But so is our attempt to understand to which extent do we gain knowledge 
only in respect to phenomena that are repetitive, described through the nomothetic, through laws, and other phenomena that are singular, that are unique. A work of art is unique. There is no law to be discovered in the work of art. There is meaning to be discovered in the work of art. In the domain of science, we're interested in the laws because we're interested in being able to reproduce whatever we learn in the process of data acquisition in order then to be more successful in our activities. The beautiful sentence that comes from Muriel Rukeyser, the universe is made of stories and not of atoms, is very telling in respect to how in the end we are going to express even scientific knowledge. If you take Newton's theory, if you take Einstein's theory, they are all stories of a very particular perspective. And that perspective, for those who are more familiar with these uh, physical theories, is reflected then in the equations, is reflected in the experiments that we can carry out. Heliocentrism, natural selection, plate tectonics, gravity, they are all very important ways in which we describe reality. The meaning of science is none other than to understand which are the practical consequences of learning something about an object of our interest. To conclude, Semiotics is not simply an inconsequential discourse about a phenomenon of nature or one of uh, the living. It is one that is essential for our understanding of what does it mean when we deal with this or that phenomenon. In other words, the necessity of dealing with meaning is not a luxury. It's not like the icing on the cake. It is what makes, in the end, that cake that is the knowledge for which we're fighting so desperately to gain and then to be able to apply. The last slide is simply an illustration of a very simple moment the narration of the 9-11 events in which you have the narration of the stock market crashing, you have the narration of what happens in society, but you have even more important, the representation, the story of some people who lost people who were, were very dear to them, of some people who started asking questions pertaining to the nature of the relations that we have among ourselves and among those who are different from us, who are pursuing a different uh, perspective of life. The necessity of dealing with meaning has to be recognized because otherwise we will continue to make progress in climbing on a hill that when we reached we have no idea why in the world did we try to reach it.